I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I'm going to talk about another aspect of technology for people who are traveling, living abroad, being expats, digital nomads, and so forth. And that is video game technology. And before you just excuse it and disappear and, and click off of the video, I want to explain that I feel that, yeah, if you're a full-time traveler and you're really spending a lot of time as a tourist and you're going from place to place and you're seeing a lot of things, it may not make sense to have very much accommodation for video games. You can always play a game on your phone and leave it at that. But for a lot of people, especially expats, once you're settling into a place, not only are video games a part of everyday life and you may want to be able to address them well, which is what we're be talking about, but it may not occur to a lot of people just how important video games may become given the expat lifestyle. We're going to talk more about that after the bump. For a lot of you, video games may be the last thing that you're going to think about when you're looking at living abroad as an expat or a long-term digital nomad or living here in paradise of Nicaragua. You're going to say to me, Scott, look, I, I, this doesn't make any sense. If you're living in Nicaragua, wouldn't you spend all of your time walking trails in the afternoon, sitting on the beach for sunset, sipping some tonias by the, by the ocean, and then heading into town for some live music and great food at night? Yeah, a lot of the time that's what we're going to recommend you do because that is Nicaragua in a nutshell. But first of all, this isn't a video just for Nicaragua, although it'll definitely apply here. It's for anyone who's doing any of these activities and living abroad in any number of beautiful locations all over the world, or even not so beautiful locations, should you be stuck in like a research station in Antarctica or something. But <laughs> no matter what you're doing, once you start settling in, whether it's you're a digital nomad and just, you, yeah, you're moving from place to place, but you're mostly still living your life, or you're an expat and you're actually settling in, at some point you don't want to, normally, simply spend all of your time doing new activities in your new place. At some point you're going to want normal everyday activities, and those include chatting with your friends online, playing some video games, maybe watching a TV show or a movie or something. Things that you would do back wherever you came from in your normal life before you became a roaming whatever or living abroad, whatever it is that you are, you probably had things that you enjoy. And there's a really good chance that by moving abroad, those things are going to reduce in your life. I used to watch certain television shows or shows of a certain type on a regular basis. How I Met Your Mother, Frasier, uh, Are You Being Served, Keeping Up Appearances, The Vicar of Dibley. All of those were things that my wife and I would watch, not every year for all of them, but on any given year. We would certainly see one of those shows or something like it. It was very normal for us to binge a television show every six to 12 months. That was not that we were, you know, huge TV people, but certainly we had these things that we did. And when we moved abroad, the amount that we do that has reduced dramatically instead of one every six months and maybe one every two, two and a half years. But it doesn't mean that we still don't want to do it. And it doesn't mean that we don't want it to be easy. So we, we bring with us things that we want to do. And when you first arrive in a new place, especially here in Nicaragua, I'll use as the example, yes, you very likely are going to want to spend your time walking the streets, going to the beach, doing these really exciting activities that you couldn't do before or couldn't do in this setting before. You want to be outside and enjoying whatever the weather is. Wherever you are, the weather is going to be different than where you're from. The, the trees will be different. The animals will be different. The people, the language, all these things will be different. So you're going to have this desire, probably, to get out and do all these activities. And that may last for three months. It might last for three years. But at some point, it is almost certainly going to dial back considerably. It probably will never go away completely, but it will go away a lot. At some point, things that you enjoy doing will fall into a pattern. And you will adjust from what you did where you lived before because your pattern is based on what you naturally would want to do combined with pressures from the outside environment. For example, if it's very expensive to go out to eat, you're going to naturally lean towards activities that can be done without going out to eat to save money, but you still will go out just less. And if you're in a place where going out is super cheap or super easy, or there's always live music instead of just once in a while, well, if you like live music and you like having a beer with friends, you're likely to do it way more often because it's something that the barrier to doing it has gotten so low. So we know that the environment plays a factor, but your personal desires, your natural state of things that you want to do also plays a factor. For an awful lot of people, that means staying home and watching TV 
and playing video games, especially now. Boomers are less likely to do this, but some of them will do it too. But once you hit Gen X, we're really defined, and I'm in the Gen X category, we're really defined by being the generation that started playing video games. I didn't have video games when I was really little, but when I was moderately little, they started showing up places, and by the time I was seven, I had some small amount of video games at home. By the time I was 11, it was part of my lifestyle. So for me, it's an important part of my childhood and my personal culture, my personal personal experience uh, in having video games. My children, who are Gen Z and Gen Alpha, are extremely into video games. They look at video games the way that we looked at basic movies and television and books. It is their literature and their entertainment. It fills a much bigger piece of their lives than it did for any previous generation. So for them, giving up or doing away with video games would be very difficult and very impactful. Also, for my kids, they're interested in going to work in the video game industry, so that would be extra impactful. So that's an extreme example. But this is true for nearly anyone under the age of 50. Video games are likely to be a very important part of your lifestyle. If you're over 50, you easily are still very much into video games, but the chances that it would be a a feeling of, of depression and crippling to give them up is less likely to be true, but certainly possible there as well. So when you're coming and you're traveling and you're doing all these things, how do you deal with video games? Well, of course you can take a PlayStation with you, you can take a, a big gaming computer with you, and there's ways you can do that. And when we moved to Nicaragua, we did that. Video games are a big deal for us, and we knew that. So we got a gaming machine, a big, huge, honking custom build with big graphics card and a VR headset and the whole the Oculus Rift S and like the whole nine yards, and we brought it with us. And this caused a number of problems. One is that there was a lot of luggage that we had to bring in with that. So first of all, it's an expensive computer. Not terrible terribly, but it's not super cheap either. And it took up a lot of luggage. So we had this huge amount of luggage that's filled with that. And then with the VR headset, like everything. And then when we came through customs, they're like, this is not reasonable for a tourist to have. This is going to be taxed. And so we got hit with a really big tax on it, which is okay, but it made the whole thing that much more expensive, that much more cumbersome. And now we have it, now we use it. We're glad that it's here. It's very useful for us. And overall, it was probably the right decision. If we knew how everything would play out over time, we probably would still have brought it with us. But in general, uh, now that the world has changed a little bit, things have advanced, I would not make the same decision again today, but if I had to go back in time knowing what I know, I may make the same decision back then. What we found, though, is that especially when moving, there's some amount of prioritization that you're going to have change. And what we found for us is that playing the absolute newest games at the absolute highest quality are things we're willing to sacrifice. This doesn't apply to everyone. I definitely have some people on my channel who are like, but I have a $3,000, 35 inch, 4K, 250 hertz refresh monitor that's curved. And, you know, I got to bring it with me. And I'm like, you have a what? Like, that's insane. And if that's the thing that really matters to you, if that's really your hobby, which clearly it is for them, yeah, you're going to need to find a way to bring that in. You're going to need to pay the taxes on it. And that's just unfortunate, but that's going to be your thing. But for most of us, right? So if you're in the extreme category where you're like, um, I'm a full-time esports player, like, okay, it's different. But for most of us, people who play and even take it pretty seriously, but who are still a little bit casual, it's not our professional job and we still do other things, but still play a lot. It is worth considering a little bit of falling just a little bit behind on games. It depends on what you play uh, and, and going for a little bit lower quality. But being able to drastically reduce your footprint in video gaming may go a long way to making the whole video game experience a lot better for you. And let me talk about let me show you in person what I mean. While our main gaming system is a very large gaming computer that we custom built and has a lot of nice features in it. What I would recommend for most people is something a lot more portable, and what device specifically makes sense for you will certainly be dictated by the kind of games you play, what, what brands you want to have, your personal gaming experience. And maybe you want to have multiple things, that's fine too. But I want to show one that a lot of people are not aware of that makes a world of difference for a lot of people, and that is what's in this box. This is a complete carrying kit for an entire video game rig. This is the Steam Deck from Valve. I'm going to show this to you. This is the entire gaming system. This is my wife's. This is a new one. This is the OLED. It's got a protective screen. This is an entire gaming computer. Now, I'm not going to keep showing it to you. I'll show you a little bit. You can really see it. And then I'm going to put it away so I don't accidentally drop it or anything. Because I am outside and don't want anything. To, it is a little bit delicate. And these are generally quite a bit cheaper 
than a normal gaming computer. Typically, someone who's gonna be buying a gaming computer is gonna spend upwards of $1,000 and maybe upwards of $2,000. But for someone who's getting one of these, which does an amazing job, you can get into these for in the high 400s, and they generally aren't gonna cost you more than in the 700s. And there's a lot of things that make this a lot better than a normal gaming desktop. Not only are you looking at something that is likely cheaper to purchase, but it's also something that's very portable. It comes in a carrying case. This is the kind of thing that will qualify as a tourist device no matter where you're going. So paying import taxes on this would be absolutely crazy. I've never heard of anyone needing to do that. Plus, it is a full gaming PC. It's able to play games that you would get on a PC. And for those who are familiar with Steam, it connects directly to your Steam library and lets you work with it just transparently it's so easy now not every game on steam works on every computer and ones that work on this are specifically uh notated within the app which is really handy maybe not all the games you want to play are going to work on it but a lot do and a lot more work on it than are notated because they just haven't had time to test them all yet but this is the second generation of this device absolutely fantastic and one of the nice things about it is you don't need a separate controller it can be hooked to a computer if you need to. You can hook external controllers to it if you want. You can hook a keyboard and mouse to it if you want. You can get a, uh, a docking station for it. You just pop it in and have that connected to a TV or whatever, and it'll become like a traditional video game console, just like having a PlayStation or an Xbox or whatever, but it plays PC games instead. This is a really smooth gaming experience that gives you a huge range of low-cost games, and that's another thing that's important for a lot of people when you're traveling you're becoming an expat, often we're trying to reduce our financial footprint. And this type of gaming system does that really well, not just in the hardware, but in your access to games. Now I have talked and we're not gonna go into it in detail here, but if you're on Steam and manage to get a credit card from here in Nicaragua, you're gonna get Nicaraguan pricing on games and that will save you a lot of money. If you're buying from GOG, which is what I do a ton from GOG, just by being here and having an IP address here, will eventually, it doesn't change instantly, will eventually switch and you'll get the Nicaraguan pricing even using an American credit card or Canadian, German, whatever. Uh, and so, so consider those things are also factors. But even before that, Steam and GOG and, and Epic and those services really reduce the cost of games compared to PlayStation, Xbox, or whatever. Plus, you have to do digital delivery when you're living in, and not have to, but it's only practical to do digital delivery when you're in uh, Nicaragua or anywhere. You're traveling, you're a digital nomad, you're an expat. You can't just go to the store typically and pick up the things that you want. You gotta get them online. And so this modality of doing everything that's based around being online works really, really well. But because you can put it in a docking station and hook it up to a computer monitor or a television, it means that by putting a keyboard and mouse onto it as well, you instantly have the ability to have a full computer as well. And this is not as weird as the Coleco Atom in the early 1980s. This is actually incredibly practical. Video game computers are real computers. They have loads of power. They're able to do all kinds of things. Why not use them as a desktop? If you're a full-time office worker, you probably want something that is custom designed for exactly what you need. I understand. I do too. I use a Mac for my main work. I have regular laptops for things. But if I needed to just do casual work just once in a while, I want to have a big screen, I want to be able to type uh, emails with a keyboard, but I don't want to do it on a, a phone. I need something, but it's just casual. It's just once in a while. I'm not using it all the time. The Steam Deck uh, honestly works incredibly well. It's a very powerful, very usable desktop computer and that you can take it with you anywhere you're going and play your video games on it just makes it super versatile. And that's pretty fantastic. So for an awful lot of people, I would recommend seriously taking a look at your video game playing habits, your history, the things that you're willing to give up, where you want to spend your money, and really take a look at it as something like the Steam Deck doesn't make sense for you to give you an excellent video gaming experience. I mean, this device is beautiful. Its screen is beautiful. Its built-in controls are beautiful. It has all kinds of haptic controls and motion controls and great sound. You can put headphones, you can do anything. Every feature you've ever heard in a video game console, this thing has, except for VR, and it at a very affordable price and makes everything so easy. By the time you're going through customs with it, by the time you're traveling, you can throw it in a backpack. My kids take theirs with them all the time, all over the place. It makes video gaming so easy. Figure out if you can live with the limitations of it, and it might be an answer to giving you a better video game experience long term for less money, and that ultimately, right, what, what could be better? Uh, and so that's where we've been leaning is that figuring out that, that Steam Decks are able to give us the video games we want to play, and as long as we every so often get a new Steam Deck, we're able to have multiple ones, 
everyone in the family can have one. I just get hand-me-downs, right? So I'm waiting for mine, uh, but, but that works out really well. And we can have them hooked up all over. We can move them around. We can take them when we go on travel. If we decide we're gonna relocate or live somewhere for a few weeks or months, we can take it with us. We're not limited. We're not leaving our life behind just because we're traveling. And so that stuff is really big. Now, in the same form factor, you can also get things like the Nintendo Switch. That's going to be even cheaper, but extremely limited, and the games cost many times more. Often, games on a Switch are like $50 to $70, and there's rarely a major discount, whereas on the Steam Deck, loads of games can be just $1, and going over $20 or $30 is relatively easy to never do. Of course, you can buy some really expensive things, but it's also really easy to avoid those things. The most expensive we've ever spent is like 60, and it's like one or two times when we have thousands of titles. Whereas on the Switch, we routinely spend 40 to 70. We have like four titles we won't buy anymore because none of them are as good. And, and just to be clear, this is so much more hardware than the Nintendo Switch. It's like comparing an Atari 2600 to a modern PlayStation 5, like the gap is so unbelievably huge. It's not quite that big, but it really is big. It can't be overstated just how this is the ultimate in modern technology and the Nintendo Switch is multiple generations behind everything else. So one is the most extreme on one side and this is the most extreme on the other. But, and also this is custom hardware designed by Valve, all custom built. The Switch is actually old parts from a failed NVIDIA product called the NVIDIA Shield. And it was absolute garbage. It was meant to be a video game console. It was terrible. And Nintendo bought it when it was old and repackaged it as the Switch. And because they controlled the whole ecosystem, they were able to make games actually work on it. But just Nintendo games, which are generally super underpowered and underwhelming. And so that's the experience we've pretty much seen with the Switch. It works okay, but it is so unbelievably outdated. It was a really old slow machine in 2017 when I got my first one. And today it's really a joke how bad it is. But if you're looking for Nintendo style games, that's where they work, right? They don't come anywhere else. So there's not going to be a better version of it. You might as well get the Nintendo Switch. So we found our kids do have the Switch. They have a couple of games they will play on there. They almost never use it, but the, the Steam Deck gets used all the time. And my wife doesn't have a Switch. I never use the Switch. We never even think of using them, but the Steam Decks, we have multiple ones. We use it all the time. So that is a thing that I think people overlook and could be an amazing answer to make you say, oh, Gaming was going to be really hard. I was either going to do something that was so hard that it was going to make me really unhappy, or I was going to give it up and not have it. And the Steam Deck gives you 90% of a really amazing gaming experience at very, very low cost and very low effort. And so it uh, specifically, I recommend very highly if it meets your needs uh, and things like the Nintendo Switch work great. Just consider that there are some creative ways you can get video games and keep a really good gaming experience when you're traveling, whether for you or for your kids or your whole family, uh, that's an important thing. And so if you're looking at the Steam Deck, just consider you probably are going to want to add some Xbox controllers to it so your whole family can play together if that's something that your family does. But mine certainly does. And you might want to carry like HDMI cables and things and be able to hook it up to a TV. That's really nice to be able to take a trip and just have a quiet night and be like, you know what? Oh, we, we spent the weekend in Esteli with the kids and we kind of just want to play some video games or watch some Netflix. We don't have, you can do everything right from the Steam Deck. It's the only thing you need to bring with you. Just bring it and a little docking station and a cable. Plug it into whatever TV's in your hotel room. Order in a pizza and that night when you're like, oh, I d we didn't have anything to do at night. We had to do stuff during the day. Now you can treat it like you're at home and bring your own games, your own whatever, your media with you. I think that's something that will be good for a lot of people. We also, and thanks to my dad who got this for the kids, have a uh, mini gaming computer. Now we got one from B-Link, but it's not an endorsement for B-Link specifically. I did mention them in the computer video as well, but we have a gaming computer. Now the reason that we want this, twofold. One, we don't want any more big gaming rigs like we had in the past that proved to be a major problem, so we're not doing that. We're sticking to really small devices that we can throw in backpacks and stuff. So the B-Link uh, gaming machine is one of them, the Steam Deck is another. So that's the direct we're leaning in the future and we're kind of slowly absorbing the games we can't play that way until the technology catches up like you you end up having to take a little bit of delay in the way that we're approaching it as far as buying the very latest biggest hardest to play games but that's about it 
So we have loads of amazing games, but sometimes, because we're big time gamers, like really, really big, we have a massive library, sometimes we need to be able to play Windows. And our big gaming rig actually failed for a long time. For two years, we weren't able to use it. And so we were we were we had all these games we weren't able to play. Uh, and we got this small B-Link gaming machine. We're able to load it up with the Windows games that don't work on the Steam Deck or ones that we just want to have permanently attached to a TV that we play together as a family. And we use that as well. That's also proven to be very useful and we really en enjoy and, and recommend that kind of device. But it depends. For most people, I would say the Steam Deck fits the bill. But if you're a little bit more hardcore gamer, you have this library of things that you want to be able to play and you need to be able to, you got to run Windows or you got to run a specific version of something, something like the B-Link uh, can do a really good job uh, without breaking the bank and without causing immigration and customs problems. It's still small enough that it qualifies as a reasonable portable device that you could bring with you as a tourist rather than being a clearly you're bringing this giant thing to leave behind, making it an import. In the same vein, if you enjoy playing VR games or if you've never tried it, the new Meta Quest 3, hopefully I get that name right, is the VR headset that just came out and it has enough power that you're able to play a lot of games. It does a really great job. You're able to watch my shows like Nicaragua 360 and the upcoming VR shows on Nicaragua 360. We are gonna put them all in the same channel for at least the time being. We'll see if we split them out into two separate channels in the future. But with a headset, you're able to do some amazing stuff with tourist videos, with 3D movies, with all kinds of things and play VR games. Of course, that's what it's built for. But the new Quest 3 and the older Quest 2, if that's something that you just want something cheaper that will do as, not as many things, one of the nice things about it is it doesn't require a gaming computer. When we first got our Oculus Rift, we were living in Texas and it didn't matter that it was portable. We got a system that plugged into the computer. It required lots of cables. It was very hard to configure with the computer. It was a huge pain, but it produced really good results. And that's why we have the big gaming computer that we have is so it would power that VR system back in the day. We decided now that we're living abroad, even though our VR system is here, it caused so many problems with the computer and just didn't work very well. We were never sure if it was going to work. We decided to get the Quest 3 and get that and use that because it has a built-in computer. So it's, it's completely portable. So it goes in a carrying case. Everything that it needs goes in there and we can take it anywhere we want with us. It allows us to play games separately from the Steam Deck, separately from any of the other gaming machines, but it's also portable. So if we want to go somewhere in the car, we can just take it in the car and the kids have another thing that they're able to use as entertainment. Now we don't normally travel with it, but we aren't that big of VR gamers. But if that is something you end up really liking, that system has been excellent as far as being self-contained, working really well. It's much more affordable than the than the Rift was back in the day. Uh, it's, it's a technology who has kind of come into maturity. So you're able to get the Quest 2 and Quest 3, which do an awful lot of really good stuff at very affordable prices. The last time I looked at the Quest 2, it was only $250. And I think the Quest 3 is in the $500 range. Like it is quite a bit more, but it does quite a bit more as well. So good reasons why that might be the one that you want, but both of them are just, you charge them up, they're batteries. Of course, the battery doesn't last super long, but they're just rechargeable. You just wear them, you just have the headset and the two controllers, and everything goes into a nice carrying case. The cases are separate, and we can take it with us. It's easy to go through customs with it, all kinds of really great experiences. So that is the thing. If that's something you're interested in in VR gaming, that is the way to go. Don't go for something that hooks to a computer. It is, unless you're a full-time VR player and like you know that you're a professional and you have to have special stuff, portable, simple, affordable, it solves all the things. So we're able to keep VR for our kids and we will be able to maintain that long-term as something they're able to do. And I'm able to use it for my 360 and uh, VR 180 video viewing, which I don't do that often, but I really enjoy when I get to do it. I think all that stuff is really cool. So that is something that you may want to consider as well. However, for those who are looking at Nicaragua specifically, because I know this video is a little bit general, just be aware that in really hot climates like this, wearing a VR system does have a tendency to make you really, really warm. So you're going to want to almost always run extremely heavy air conditioning with that. So if that's not something you can do or want to do, just consider that it may make VR not nearly as attractive as it would be in someplace like North America. All in all for us, yes, we're a big video gaming family, but having portable video games that allow us to always have games with us when we're living abroad or even when we're traveling like lightly on like family vacations, even, you know, we live in Nicaragua, but we vacation to Costa Rica, for example, the things that we have, the equipment that we have is so easy to bring along. We can go for a weekend in Costa Rica, bring video games with us, which when you have children, very often they don't want 
want to do activities late into the night. They want to be able to, you know, have dinner, go back and have some time to themselves and do their own activities and not miss, you know, video games that they've been in the middle of or not keep watching TV shows that they were binging. It's uh, important not to be too disruptive in many cases to their lives and portable video game technology like we're talking about here can be a really great way to to keep a semblance of the activities that we enjoyed from before we became expats, from before we became digital nomads, before we moved abroad, and bring that with us. And if you've never gotten into video games, this is not the video to convince you as to why video games are a great media for storytelling or adventure or whatever, but I do have channels just for that. I am a big believer that video games are the future of literature and the, by far the most robust form of it, far beyond anything that the written word or pre-recorded television can do. This could be your, your opportunity. Approach video gaming a little bit differently. Something like a Steam Deck can be a really good entrance into a world of easy video gaming that's super flexible that you can also use as a desktop if you don't need to buy a computer for any other reason and have all of your technology handled by one simple portable device that you can use for everything, everywhere. And uh, it's got its own screen, so you don't even have to hook it up to something unless you really want to for whatever reason. Very flexible. It may be that by being an expat or digital nomad and having a different budgetary outlook on the world, a different location to buy things from, a totally different lifestyle, maybe video games fits into your lifestyle in a way that you had not thought might be possible before. Anyway... That is my thoughts on some video gaming approaches that may make sense when you're living in beautiful Nicaragua or being a digital nomad or expat anywhere in the world. And of course, you may discover that you just don't enjoy video games or that your move to a new place has negated the reasons that you played it in the past. That could be the case. But most people, especially those under 50, video games are such a part of our lives, asking people to not be able to play them in a pretty good way. Of course, you can always play something on your phone, but not having like a big screen, a controller, like you may not need to do it all the time. I can go months without actually playing a game but every so often, I really need to be able to sit down and play one, and I definitely want to play them with my kids and my wife. Our family has just always been very big on gaming. All My wife and I were gamers before we ever met each other, right? We grew up with games, so it's an important thing. It would be like asking people to not have television anymore or movies anymore or books anymore. Our generations just... It would be weird to not have those video games, and it's an important part of world culture. It helps keep you connected to communities back home. So it is something that you very likely are going to want to be able to address. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, it would do a lot of favor if you shared this on social media, posted it on Reddit and Facebook and those things. Tell a friend or family member about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow. And for your viewing pleasure, four additional episodes will pop up on the screen. You can pick one at random or check out their titles. Typically, they're from the same date, but a year or two ago. I don't have every date covered, so some of them are kind of random. Just choose one. It really helps out the show.